What are you doing? You're looking at the face of heroin in the United States. This is 24-year-old Danielle Ott. Her mother took this home video. It was intended to be a wake-up call for her daughter. And this is the result of drugs. Danielle is incoherent, a graphic testament to a life spiraling out of control. And to make matters worse, Danielle, already a mother of two, is pregnant again. She's all I, that's my life right here. She's my life. Danielle has the unwavering support and love of her mother, Melody Anger, a public school bus driver. Danielle is trying to get clean and live her life heroin free. Every time I would try to quit, I would get sick and then I would want it. And it was just, it was the hardest thing I've ever had to do, probably. I've tried to quit it. I tried to quit it, I couldn't tell you how many times. But with the fall also comes a shot at redemption. After trying and failing, trying and failing, Danielle is now on a mission. Danielle quit doing heroin and entered a prenatal program. She's taking a drug called Suboxone to help with the effects of heroin withdrawal. Doctors say her ultrasound looks normal, but there's some damage Danielle cannot undo. Her child will be born addicted to opioids and the many problems that come with it. I just can't handle that, like, looking at my baby and knowing, like, I did that. Like, I just think that is the most selfish thing in the world to do. Danielle grew up a good student with lots of friends, not the kind of person one might think who would get hooked on heroin. I was really against drugs altogether. Like, I did not like drugs at all. Like, I would not talk to somebody if they did a little tiny pain pill. Like, I would freak out. But before Danielle was out of her teens, life changed dramatically. Actually, I found out I was pregnant the day after I graduated high school with my daughter. So how did this working class young woman go from a loving mother and serious student to a full-blown heroin addict? Her path to addiction is a familiar story in the United States. After the birth of her son two years ago, Danielle developed an ulcer. Doctors gave her powerful opioid pain medication. How long did it take you to get hooked on those pain pills? Not long, not long at all. I wasn't hurting anymore, but I had it in my head that I was like, my stomach still hurt and stuff. and. So I thought I needed the medicine, but I really, I really was, I didn't need it, I wanted it. And then, then next thing I know, like, I, caught, I like found myself like needing them every day, all day long. It's not uncommon to see first responders in Huntington assist overdose victims from the brush near the Ohio River. It's one place for users to get high. Doctors writing millions of prescriptions for opioids help fuel a U.S. crisis, a generation of junkies involving hundreds of thousands of people. By now, Danielle was always chasing the high, but her prescription for oxycodone had run out. And on the street, a single pill can sell for $80. I called my friend looking for pills, and she told me that she couldn't get them, that she had heroin on her right then and there, that it was the same thing as pain pills. After that, you know, I didn't, what was the point in buying pills whenever I can spend 30 bucks on that? Danielle tells her story in an American town I know well, Huntington, West Virginia, population 50,000. Huntington has the unwelcome distinction of being the heroin overdose capital of the United States. It's also my hometown. I grew up here, played baseball as a kid, graduated from what was then Huntington East High School, went to college at Marshall University. I've known the city's mayor, Steve Williams, a long time. Huntington was built with steel and railroad jobs, but these days rail cars once loaded with coal sit mostly idle. Heavy industry has taken a hit during the economic downturn. But Huntington rebounded as Marshall University expanded and the region's largest hospital, Cabell Huntington, blossomed into a teaching facility. People are starting to invest in our community, but 
what's breaking my heart is there is this flip side. This truly is, Sean, this is what I will say the tale of two cities. It's the best of times, but we have truly the worst of times. You're sure you're only a pipe today? If anybody had told me two years ago that I would be as immersed in this issue, I would have never and would have never ever believed it. The tree-lined streets are clean. This working class town is dotted with quaint homes and a popular park system. So my hometown isn't suffering with the graffiti and blight that plagues other U.S. cities wrestling with the heroin crisis. But on one mid-August day, the opioid problem pushed the city, its first responders, police, and hospitals to its very limit. Remember, this is only a town of 50,000, and in one four-hour period, 26 people overdosed on heroin. One of the most common things that you'll see happen is the uh, people start dumping, uh, literally dumping people um, out at the hospital. I think that the most interesting thing about the uh, how that began was the uh, the first call came out. Probably want to run into her. Uh, Dispatch advised that the uh, the caller said that send the police, send help. Uh, that everyone that came into the house was dying. On the front lines, five nights a week. Sergeant Phil Watkins says drugs and related crime and death are commonplace. Calls come in all the time. In this case, a man in his early 30s has OD'd and is no longer breathing. First responders are working frantically to reverse the effects of a heroin overdose. All emergency personnel in this town carry a drug called naloxone, marketed as Narcan. All it takes is one injection to override the fact heroin has shut down his breathing and slowed his heartbeat. I'll tell you what, we need to take you to the hospital. He's giving you Narcan. And slowly, he comes out of the opioid stupor and cheats death. We want you to get medical help, okay? We just don't want you to die. It's very disheartening when we see the repeat overdoses. Uh, you know, we had one the other night. It was, I think he said it was his third time. Um, and, you know, I just told him, um, you, you know you're, you're playing the odds at this point. There's not a family, there's not a neighborhood, there's not a block, there's not a business, there's not a church that isn't Im impacted by this. Yeah. Holly and Patrick Hickman are the last people, you would think, who would have their lives touched by the heroin epidemic in the U.S. Affluent, active in the community. He's a bank vice president, she's a teacher. We've had a great marriage from day one. Um, we uh, are a fortunate couple in that we share a whole lot of common interests. They really are that married couple who are the best of friends. Both are Huntington natives from upstanding families. Patrick's late father, Bob Hickman, a pharmacist, gave me my first job while in college working at Cabell Huntington Hospital. Their world was perfect with the addition of two healthy boys. Uh, Turner first. Blonde hair, blue eyes, questions galore. Just cute as a button. And then Zachary came along and he looked more like Patrick. Separated by just a couple of years, Turner made sure his younger brother Zachary always got to hang out with the big kids. Carefree, Turner cultivated his own look and lifestyle. Whitewater rafting, uh, you know, uh, hiking, you know, all the extreme type sports, things that challenge you physically. A close family, the Hickmans chronicled their children's growth each year during an annual beach vacation. What the couple didn't know until Turner's senior year at Marshall University was the dangerous path the 23-year-old was on. He left his backpack in somebody's car and <laughs> the mother found it and looked and found paperwork in the back in there from the hospital and he had gone in and had OD'd. The Hickmans were floored. Turner had overdosed on heroin. We, we were ignorant, we were ignorant of heroin the Heroin was something, you know, people in alleys did that yeah. I'd never, and when I heard that the first time, I was just absolutely shocked. I was like, that is like big time. So I don't know who, inter who introduced heroin to him. I don't know when, where, or what it was, um, but. Um, it's not hard to find at Huntington, that's what you're saying. No. It's like super easy. The overdose capital of the United States was threatening to rip apart the family. He said it was a one-time thing, it was an experiment, it was a mistake, and I'm, I'm over it. 
Well, as loving parents who are used to a child that doesn't lie to you and does the right thing, I, I was good with it. Right. And I was then, literally good with it and moved then, on. That is, until a late night call delivered another shock. It was a girl and she said, I know you think that Turner hasn't done drugs, but he is yeah. using. In hindsight, they can see the change. You know, you hate, I look back at pictures and he is yellowish looking, he looked terrible. The family united, circled the wagons, and got Turner into therapy and rehab. They were optimistic, but Holly's father is a physician and offered a sobering prognosis. Addicts slip. You know, I'm thinking he said he had, he's made it 90 days. You know, we're going to be the one. I remember screaming at my father, who was the, the not the naysayer, the knowledgeable one. And he was saying, honey, 99% of the people go back and, and use again. Well, and I was, why can't he be the 1%? The goal was to get Turner clean for 90 days. Things were going well. Then, just a few days shy of the goal, Holly got a phone call. I said, oh, hi, Turner, and um, somebody was on the phone, and they said, we're trying to reach Turner's dad. And I said, well, this is his mother. And they said, well, we're at Turner's apartment, and he's gone. And I said, gone where? What are you talking about? And they said, he's dead. And he overdosed. And I just dropped I, in everything. Patrick and Holly rushed to his apartment. There were police, an ambulance, flashing lights, and confusion. Police stopped Holly from going inside the apartment to see Turner's body. I'm his mom, I'm his mom, I want to go in. They said, you don't want to see him like that. When they relapse, they go back and they get a dose that they took before they went off. That dose is too powerful in many, many cases. It was six agonizing days before they saw Turner at the funeral home. And people say closure. It's not closure. There's no closure. Well, but I mean, it, was it was helpful. It was helpful, but it was not, yeah. no magical thing happened. Getting Turner heroin free for three months had been an important milestone. They were going to celebrate as a family and go skydiving together. Holly and her blonde haired, blue eyed, question filled child took one last trip together as she scattered his ashes. Huntington is in danger of losing a generation. The contacts, the, the emails, the, the telephone calls, the letters that I was getting from individuals, mothers, grandparents, saying, Mayor, please, can't you do something? It's not safe for our children to, to, to go out. You're looking at the youngest addicts. At Cabell Huntington Hospital, the staff says one out of every four babies born here comes into the world addicted to heroin. Danielle's newborn will be a member of this group with shaking and tremors and trouble digesting food. I wanna cry. I was talking to a girl the other day and she had just had her baby. And she was telling me like, I can't do this right now. <laughs> And she was telling me about, like, after she had her baby, how her baby started going through withdrawals almost three days later. She told me about it tremoring. Some of the nurses at Lily's Place work here. Sarah Murray is a neonatal therapeutic nurse who will work closely with Danielle and her baby once the child is born. And we have a 36 bed unit in the NICU. And at that point, we were um, turning away transports of critically ill infants that needed to be here. There are so many heroin addicted babies born here, other newborns with life threatening ailments have to be turned away and transported to facilities not nearly as qualified to handle babies in crisis. Most of our babies probably. I'm going to give a guesstimate of about 80% of our babies are polysubstance abuse. Meaning more than one? More than one drug. Were you doing other drugs as well? Uh, no. I wasn't drinking or anything like that. Um, the only other thing I was doing was like meth and that was it. And 
just meth and heroin. That's all I was doing. Dr. Sean Loudon has devoted his career and his life to working with babies born to moms who do drugs. Loudon will oversee the care Danielle's baby receives. A native West Virginian, Loudon has won absolute mandate for his staff. Anybody who works um, here in this facility will have a non-judgmental attitude and their approach um, to the parents and to the babies. People can't even fathom some of the stories that these moms tell of their own abuse, of their own, you know, horrific childhood. Many of them come from families who, where their mothers and their grandmothers have been addicted and it's just they're normal. As strange as it is to us and as abnormal as it is to us to crush up a pill and snort it, it's normal to them. Danielle got drawn into that hideous cycle. You just don't care about nothing anymore. And like, all you worry about is like, well, I want to do more, I want to do more, I want to do more, I want to do more. Murray says working with drug addicted newborns is challenging, but progress is coming. We learned that everything we thought we were doing to help the babies was really making their withdrawal. We were overstimulating and making their withdrawal more difficult for them. Out of necessity, the hospital staff created a neonatal therapeutic unit, different and separate from the intensive care nursery. It's quiet, less light, less stimulation, which is good for addicted infants. Loudon says before criticizing mothers like Danielle, remember in 2012, doctors wrote 260 million opioid prescriptions, enough to supply every adult in the country with his or her own bottle of pain tablets. When birth occurs, that baby's supply to the drug is instantaneously cut off. And so the baby is quitting whatever substance that mom has been taking, cold turkey. If you ask any addict what it feels like to withdraw, the first thing they will tell you is it's very painful. And these babies are no different and uh, classically from opiates, a lot of what they will sort of show are neurologic symptoms. Um, they will shake, um, have tremors. Um, they'll have increased muscle tone. They'll be irritable, um, cry. Loudon tries to step away from the pressure when he can, but he's always thinking of ways to pull his community out of the throes of an addiction crisis. But it's not just Huntington there's an epidemic across the United States. The most recent statistics show nearly half a million people addicted to opioids in the U.S. We have to break the cycle of hopelessness some way, somehow. I think hope is everything. Um, our country faces this epidemic, um, and there's no denying that. But there are people who are trying to change that. Loudon and his staff learn babies born addicted to opioids don't necessarily have to spend months in a hospital. So they help turn a vacant office building in a residential section of Huntington into Lily's place. It's a facility that is set up um, for its sole purpose being to treat babies who are going through withdrawal. We are basically um, able to provide the same care that these babies get in a hospital setting, but it's just not in a hospital. We're fortunate to have some very forward thinkers um, and people who are willing to, to sort of stick their neck out um, and try something different because what had been, you know, the same thing for years and years and years didn't seem to be working effectively. Mayor Steve Williams said the city didn't even know how to zone the site. Is it a health care facility, a group home? All Williams knew is the city faced a crisis. I've constantly said, let's approach things in such a way that we'll set a standard that others will seek to follow. Unlike crack cocaine babies, newborns suffering from heroin addiction typically don't come into the world with physical birth defects. But Loudon says opiates have a way of rewiring a baby's brain. While there's a lot of money being put into treatment, there are many medical unknowns. We are slowly changing some of that rewiring. But the, the simple fact of the matter is we don't know how much of that we accomplish. 
And frankly, it differs from every individual. Lilly's place costs about $1.2 million a year to run. Roughly 25% of that comes from private donations. Almost everything here was donated. The wipes, the diapers, other supplies. The rest of the funding comes from insurance, state, and federal sources. And for people such as Danielle, people shunned by society, they found something else. People who didn't judge. What we didn't realize is that we would really start caring about the moms. They're your daughter, they're your niece, they're your neighbor's daughter. We didn't plan on falling in love with them and wanting to make their lives better. They are all addicted, and most, like Danielle Utt, are scared, wondering if they will ever have a normal life again. Danielle's baby could end up in a room at Lily's place where everything was donated by Turner Hickman's family. She has the chance Turner never got. I mean, it took everything away from me, everything. Everything I had had, it took everything. I had nothing left. So can you, can you tell me what you're on? Let us like so many others, Danielle has flirted with death. There was one time I had done it, and then I woke up three hours later with, I, mean, I was shooting up and I had the needle still in my arm, I had everything still laying on me, and I was, actually I was with my boyfriend at the time, and if we would have done just a little bit more, we would have, I and mean, I wouldn't be here, sitting here today. Nationally, the Obama administration is proposing $1.1 billion to fight the opioid crisis. Not nearly enough, according to those fighting the epidemic on the front lines. I wish we could have all $1.1 billion of that right here because I think it's gonna take a huge amount of resources to be able to attack this on the scale that it needs to be in certain communities because of just how, how massive of a problem it is in these communities. As much as the staff at Lily's Place is working to help mothers and their babies. We do have um, security guards uh, present um, at our facility. Um, we do um, make everybody sign in. We do um, require that um, no materials get taken back um, to the baby's rooms. What do you mean by no materials? Um, what I mean is they can't have bags, duffel bags, purses, uh, things that could contain contraband um, for drug use and abuse um, in the baby's rooms. The staff wants to help these young moms and wants to believe they want to get straight. But history has shown addicts will do just about anything to get a fix, even if it jeopardizes the well-being of their newborn. Um, and that does happen on a weekly basis um, for us. Not everything has a happy ending. Um, as much as we strive for those happy endings, the reality of drug abuse is, is sobering. This is an obvious statement. <laughs> Nothing's more permanent than death. One thing I've come to understand in my life, and we've seen this in so many other people's lives, but I've come to understand that life is a series of second and third chances. Holly and Patrick will never forget Turner. Part of his enduring legacy is a tree planted in Huntington's Ritter Park to keep his memory alive so others won't make the same tragic missteps he made. This is the face of hope in the ongoing fight against heroin abuse. Danielle gave birth to a five pound, seven ounce girl named Skylar. It's changed my life. Um, I mean, that's really all I can say. I mean, my life is completely different than what it used to be. She's been good. I mean, I'm, I don't like that she's going through withdrawals and stuff. I mean, it sucks to watch. I mean, it's the hardest thing I've ever had to do, honestly. Yeah, she's two weeks old today. But Skylar came into the world addicted to opioids, and weaning the newborn will take time, and it will be a painful process. The, the baby is progressing um, through the weaning process uh, relatively well, still has some good moments and still has some bad moments, 
um, with her withdrawal symptoms. Um, but so far, um, everything has gone you know, relatively well in her weaning process. Frankly, her quality of life is, has the potential just like every other child in this whole entire world does. Um, but a lot depends on her family. Meaning Danielle and the baby's father have to find ways to avoid falling into the same trap. I'm not at the moment, no, because watching her go through this and the stuff that she's had to go through, just, it makes me never want to look at it or see it again. It's too early to know if this chapter will have a happy ending, but Danielle has the desire, and for the time being, the support needed to stay clean. And even if Danielle and her family find happiness, Huntington will be dealing with a crisis and a generation of junkies for years to come.